thank you all for coming and you know, coming into my session. And if you need more treats, I'm a, I'm a relaxed speaker. You feel free to go get yourself more treats. And also, I'm a relaxed speaker too. So as if we're going and not, you, you don't have to um, keep your questions till the end. Feel free to ask you know, as we're going, as we're talking about something. So they asked me to talk about just preservation of cemeteries in general. Um, it, it's, as myself as a Catholic, I can say here in Indiana, we don't do a great job of keeping up our Catholic cemeteries. And I hope that this is a part of this will uh, motivate the diocese and the churches to start um, caring for the cemeteries. And a lot of people are like, why cemetery preservation? You know, no one's using that property or that ground, which is something I get told a lot by people, developers and things like that. But cemeteries are um, who is part of our cultural landscape. They're who we are as a people. You know, again, the size, the shape, the ornamentation is going to vary. Um, early cemeteries aren't going to have the ornate morning angels or the crucifixes and things like that. But then you get later, then you get these art pieces of artwork that are in there. But no matter what type of art is in the cemetery, um, the sacred ground, and they're important to our history. And so I think it's important that we keep these cemeteries and keep them um, respectable. Now, a lot of cemeteries that you're going to have are going to have long-standing issues. I mean, this cemetery here, um, the person who that was a, it's a township trustee cemetery, and when he got elected in in November and started in January, this is what he inherited. So this is not something that we did. Um, this is something that is long going. Um, in the United States, we just have not cared for our cemeteries um, the way that I think we should. Um, so this is not something that. Um, happened overnight, and so I think it's important to remember that you're not going to fix it overnight. Um, rare, unless you've got a lot of money that you can hire a company to come in and do the repair work. Um, if you're doing this through slow um, fundraising and doing a little bit every year, or you're doing it through volunteer work, that it's going to take a while, and that's okay. As long as it's, it's slow progress is better than, just, you know, turning into something like this. And I think the biggest issue is money. I mean, is you. All the preservation, it's going to take money no matter what it is. Whether you're using volunteer work, you're going to have to have some of the money for some of the materials. If you hire a company and you're like, well, with this, how, you know, how much is it going to cost in order to, to take care of something like this? Along with, you might have a cemetery that you're slowly getting, um, you have to do just general uh, maintenance, general mowing. Uh, this one, this is that Jewish cemetery there down the, down the south side. And so, you know, you've got this one. Um, they can't actually mow this cemetery. They actually have to weed eat it because the, the stones are so close together. And it's seven or eight acres. And there, so they are weed eating by hand. That takes time. Yeah, that takes a lots of time and lots of money. And then if you've got buildings or pieces of architecture along with your cemetery, then you've got even you know, more money. Plus, you've also got your churches that you're, you know, you're worried about. And so money's going to be an issue, and I understand that. And again, that's why I'm going to be a strong advocate of utilizing volunteers, and we'll talk about some projects that your volunteers could work on um, later as, they, uh, as, we, as I progress through the talk. This first one here? Yes, this is vandalism. It's, it's both vandalism and um, I call custodial care. And um, a lot of times, a lot of the damage that happens in the cemetery is from the mower, the mower deck. You know, it's a three-foot mower deck. And heaven forbid that our pioneer ancestors didn't put the stones three and a half feet from each other so that they could just mow through the, you know, on their riding lawnmower. And so then they come through with their, their mower every time and hit that stone and continually hit it, and eventually it's going to snap and break. Um, I kind of equate it when you vacuum and you when you're vacuuming at home and you hit the corner of your uh, couch, eventually you're going to chip out the, the leg of your couch. Same thing with the tombstones. These mower decks come through, um, and if someone doesn't care and is just kind of doing it at their own speed, this is in Johnson County. Just um, if you know where the Greenwood Park Mall is, this is the Greenwood Park Mall. The, the it's just uh, just not too far from there. Um, actually, it's been restored. Um, when I get done, I've got, I think I've got, I've got the after sh shot I can show you. This has actually been restored. They actually spent the money to restore it. Um, when we went in there to start working in there, there were no standing, complete standing stones. There are 150 now, complete standing stones. Is this an abandoned cemetery? Um, there's no legal definition of abandoned cemetery, so I don't use it. Um, because, so what this is, a, it's closed. It's no longer open for burials, and it's the responsibility of the township trustee. But I don't use the word abandoned because sometimes abandoned to you is neglect to me and to someone else. I mean, you know, so there's just all these different definitions. In a sense, there's no legal definition. Uh, I'm referring to the, the legal tie between the cemetery believing work and the responsibility of the trustee. 
Yeah, the trustees are responsible for, in Indiana, is anybody not from Indiana? Okay, because that's, the, I, I know Indiana law, I don't know, you know, Michigan or something like that. But in Indiana, a township trustee is responsible for cemeteries that no taxes are being paid on the property. There's no viable organization like a church that would be paying property taxes. And it's um, established before February 19th, 1939. And that date has to do with when the law was passed. So like this cemetery here is an, is an older cemetery, it's established in the 1800s. No one's paying property taxes and there's no cemetery association. So it became the responsibility of the township trustee. And, but, but, I can, but a person can own a cemetery in Indiana, so like a farmer could own the cemetery um, if they're paying property taxes on it, um, a church or something like that. And so even if they're not caring for it, it's not the responsibility of the township trustee to take over it. So, there's a, so that's why we, that word abandon can kind of be tough because for some people it means neglect, but for other people it's just um, you know, nobody taking care of it or not responsible for it or anything like that. All the cemeteries in the state, then, just not yes. in Marion County. Yeah, I work um, as a, I'm a state employee, and as a state employee for the Department of Natural Resources, my job is to identify every cemetery in the state, and then, so then also, since we're out there, you know, doing identification and location and size and shape, um, I also do some consultation on cemetery preservation and stuff. So, yeah, so I work in the entire state. A cemetery is any place there's any person in any part of decomposition. So whether it's one person, whether or not there's a tombstone there, as long as there's the body there, it's a cemetery in the state of Indiana. The I, asked is I saw a little tiny three, it looked like a personal, down Brown County, I think mm -hmm. somewhere, and it was just a, a big a tombstone and looked like a couple yep. or three people there. So that would be... It, it, that's a cemetery. Yeah. And, and, you, and in Indiana, especially southern Indiana, you get more smaller tombstone or more smaller cemeteries. Because of the topography of the land, it was difficult to get someone out to, the, to the bury them. But then if you go into northern Indiana, um, there are just fewer cemeteries, but they're larger. Because it was easy, it's flat ground, it's easy to get them out there. Bill, you had a question? Yeah. You know, I was on the first wave in the 70s of doing the county uh, inventories. Mm -hmm. My directive was not to look at cemeteries. Well, I, I disregarded that directive. And, and I, I thank anyway. you for that. <laughs> And the reason being is, it's, I knew this, even uh, when I was still a neophyte, it's, it's an important part of the cultural landscape. And cemeteries are architectural, even if there's no building, just look at the stones. Yes. So I, I disregarded my orders and recorded the cemeteries, everyone, even when the USGS map said there was one deep inside of a woods, mm -hmm. I would go ask the, the owner, I said, whereabouts is that? Because I would, I wanted to go look at. I wanted to see. I wanted to document it anyway. And today, when we do the county surveys, which is a program that my office runs, and we hire people to drive every road in a county and document bridges, buildings, cemeteries, they today get every cemetery. Um, so yeah, so we are now we have changed our methodology and realized that cemeteries are important. Um, I'll say that partly that's because I'm in the office and I just took over and said we're going to do this, and so. Yes. It's where you find your ancestors, and you're right. The, the architecture and the, the, the art and the, the, that above ground, we call it an outdoor museum basically, is an amazing thing and needs to be documented. And so we're working on those too. So I'm just trying to find the oldest stone and the most recent stone mm. to establish that. That's, that's how we establish the dates, yes. Yep. That's, I see, that's why I loved doing, working with the county surveys that you worked on. Well, <laughs> And then we've got knowledge. We had a, a very well-meaning people who go out into the cemeteries and do some things that are just, we're going to call it rough. This cemetery is down in southern Indiana, and every time I go to Madison, I pass this cemetery, and it just makes me sad. They, have, they are very well-meaning. I've actually spoken to them. I went to the church. It's, a, it's associated with the Baptist church. And I went in one day, and I said, so what did you guys do to your cemetery? It was more like why was my question. They, have, they thought they were doing good. They were trying to clean up their cemetery, but they have done everything wrong in the cemetery. So the first thing they did is, and I'm not sure why, they poured concrete over the entire, this entire um, burial area and put a flagpole in the middle. That flagpole's in the middle of a grave. Um, so you've got this concrete that's now just falling apart because it was just it's a mess. 
they lined up these people, uh, the tombstones, put them in concrete. Concrete is bad, 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 because concrete is um, stronger than stone. And you know, you think it's hard as rock, that means it's gonna last forever, but stone is very fragile and it's porous. And, and so with this one, if that mower deck came through and hit the stone, it's gonna break before the concrete will. And so they've lined these people up. First off, they're not buried this close together. So they've taken stones from other parts of the cemetery, probably out in here and stuff like that, and lined them all up. So now we don't know where anybody's buried. Instead of fixing the stones that are broken, they've just put them back to front um, so these pieces down here, this is probably one stone that's a tall tablet. And so instead of putting it back together, they have just put them together. And getting cement off of tombstones is hard. We have a cemetery preservation workshop, and we had this little baby stone. And I'm like, I'll, ch I can, I'll chip the, the concrete off of it. I broke the baby stone. So because the concrete is so intense. And so they've, you know, did that. And actually, and if you'll also look up over here, they've just piled a bunch of stones up here in the, by around this one. So again, they were well-meaning. They were trying to take care of their cemetery. I'm sure it's also easier to mow. This is much easier to mow now and things like that. But again, they've, they've kind of screwed some things up. And so that's why we encourage classes. Um, there are lots of classes in the state of Indiana. My office offers a class every year. It's um, usually in May. Um, we, here in Indianapolis, it's a day and a half class. And what I'll do is I'll offer this today is if any of you want to take the class, I always get free spots. I'll give you a free spot. So if you want, if the Lafayette Diocese wants to send someone to the cemetery preservation class, we'll offer that to you for free. Um, so that way you guys can come, can learn the, t the right techniques. Um, we also talk about laws, things like that. But there are other classes. I was actually in Richmond last night, and they were doing a class um, yesterday. So there's classes all over the state. I'm just a big advocate of getting the knowledge so that you don't become a part of my PowerPoint presentation. And then there's other concerns. You know, what's more important, the cows? And the farming or the stone? Now, not even technically. In Indiana, this is illegal. It's illegal to farm through a cemetery. And it's illegal to have cows and animal husbandry in a cemetery. The problem is, is that um, DNR is not a prosecutorial agency. And so when we um, find out that there's something like this going on, we notify the county prosecutor. And the county prosecutor is supposed to prosecute this. Well, in this case, the pro county prosecutor went, and didn't prosecute anybody because he didn't think it was a big deal. This farmer, he's like, well, he should have the right to, to have his cattle where he wants. And so you have this, cow, this cemetery that's got some severe damage and is, you know, uh, cows and horses and stuff are kind of brutal to stones because they like to rub up against them, you know, you scratch your back kind of a thing, and they'll knock them over and, and then step on them too. If it's, a, if it's a tablet and a cow or a horse steps on them, it breaks it, it shatters it pretty easily. And then also other concerns are things like what's more important, the cemetery or this is I-69 and 465 up on the northeast side of Indianapolis, and they're gonna make, I always tease, they're gonna make this into like a 75 lane um, interchange, but they moved the cemetery in order to widen the road, and that's something that's very popular is, um, our two biggest movers of cemeteries are, are NDOT and coal companies. They'll move cemeteries to, to do more coal work. Um, this cemetery actually I thought was moved in the most respectful way that this possible. It was, um, NDOT did this about three or four years ago, um, they did it through archaeology, so they found all of everybody, made sure they found all the coffin parts and clothing and anything that was left, moved them out to Crown Hill, and they're actually buried in the same grave orientation and next to the same people that they were here. So, um, and they actually found some unmarked graves, and so we were able to mark those graves now um, out at Crown Hill. But it's not uncommon to move cemeteries. Was that a contract? Yes, it was um, AMEC, yep. They do, a, they do do a lot of that. Um, I think they do an, a, a very nice job. They, I mean, they put up a tent so that you couldn't have looky-loos looking as they were driving by and trying to see the, the graves. Um, they were very, very respectful on the move. They actually, out at Crown Hill, hand dug the graves because these were hand dug graves. I know other people who would have just taken the backhoe and, and dug it that way. Um, they, but unfortunately, they did it during kind of the, one of the droughts, so it was, it was rough for them, but they continued, they hand dug all, there's 18 graves, <clears throat> and they hand dug all 18 graves. They actually were able to identify some of the people, they knew, like they knew that there was a Civil War soldier out there who had been injured during um, the, one of the battles, 
And so one of the um, unmarked graves, they could see through the bone that the bone had been repaired and had, there was, so they knew that then that that was that soldier. They were able then to uh, mark his grave. So they, they did, a I think, a very nice job on this one. Yeah. Do they have to notify families, or uh, what, what, how does, is the family involved in this process? Okay, well, unfortunately, family has no say in this. When I say family, immediate family does. So a spouse, a parent, or a child. So if they're going to move my grandparents' grave, I have no say over that. But if they're going to move my parents' grave, my husband's grave, or my child's grave, I can fight that. Then what they have to do is they have to go through a court. Uh, they have to go through the court system and get um, permission to move the, the the graves. And the court requires a variety of different things that they have to prove why they need to move it and things like that. Once they um, get that permit from the or the permission from the court, then the state Department of Health gives a permit, and then the permit is then offers two ways to move. You can move it through a funeral home director or through an archaeologist. Um, Personally, I prefer the archaeologists because I believe they get all of everything. They get all of the, um, uh, the dirt that changes colors because when you die and you decompose and you change the color of the soil. So they take all of that soil because that's part of you, um, and then they'll move it. Funeral home directors, not necessarily because they're not used to dealing with graves from the 1850s. And then they move it, and they have to move it to an active cemetery. And, um, and then some cemeteries, like this one, each person got their own grave again. I've seen others where they've um, put everybody into one grave because there's not much left. So, um, but the law doesn't say is doesn't say how many you know f graves for how many graves you had or anything like that. You just have to move it into an active cemetery. Do they try and reach out to family members and to let them know? So, like somebody in California comes and visits the Great Aunt Lucy. Right. <laughs> yes. And then she's not there anymore. So. So two things, we've got a couple things here. Um, first is they're not, they have to put some ads in the paper. But have you ever seen a legal ad in the paper? It's about that big. And if you don't read legal ads, because I certainly don't read legal ads in the paper here, you may not catch it. I, I don't, INDOT on this one, again, I, it's, INDOT did this right on so many levels. They actually reached out to the family and, and tried to find descendants and things like that because what, they did a rededication out at, the, out at Crown Hill and had the family there. So they did, but most don't. So then, all right, so then you come back from California and you're trying to find the cemetery, what do you do? Well, we have a cemetery registry, which I will talk about right now. It's a, um, we have a uh, card here about it. It's called SHARD. It stands for the State Historic Archaeology and Architecture Resource Database. And it's a list of all known historic resources in the state. So it's not just cemeteries. There's a bridge inventory. There's the county surveys. There are buildings are all now available online. So you, if you came to this, this is called the White Cell Cemetery. So if you came out to the White Cell Cemetery and you're like, where is this? If you went onto the database, and you looked up the White Cell Cemetery, it will tell you where it got moved to and when. So we're lucky in Indiana to have that database and that inventory of cemeteries, and we keep track of where cemeteries used to be, where they got moved to. So all the cemetery. Are there to tell people that? No. Yeah, you would have to. Well, hopefully, then you go to the library. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you go to, Indi to the library. And you ask the people at the, like the local library what happened. And I work a lot with the libraries in the state. And they tell you, hey, this is available, hopefully. Otherwise, yes, it is. Uh, yeah, it's tough because. That has been respectful. I, I saw this on the news. And I, went, I, knew, I was very familiar with that way back before any of this interstate was. And uh, I thought the way they did it was fine. And like Bob said, reaching out to the families and whatever, and somebody from California shows yeah. up. You know, there should be some kind of a marker, something near there that says, hey, we removed these at our Crown Hill Cemetery. They're in lot 42, section such and such. So, you know, I don't know how old the people would be to come, but if you're looking for your ancestors, like this gentleman said, you might be a teenager. A lot of people don't know all this. Go to the library. Right. Are you right. serious? We don't even write no more. <laughs> just, it's, that it's is just. Computer I mean, you know. I, I, you I, know I understand. Yes. I understand your. And we yes. don't care about the past. We don't care about. <laughs> That's history, we don't care about history. Yep. We just care about what we want to do. We're putting in this interstate and we're going to do what we want to do. Yes. And, and so I don't I'm, like the government's attitude and that kind of thing when it comes to historical and preservations and respect to people. 
We're the only human beings on Earth. Yep. And nobody wants to respect anybody. And, and unfortunately, it's not just the government. I think it's us as a, I mean, developers. Ever. Well, it's, it's, you're it's, here with the government, or you're yeah. with your agency, so. Is, yeah. is this the, the cemetery before the? Before the move. Before yes. the yeah. move. Is the road on top of these? Uh, not these yet. Things? It will. Be, it, the road will be on top of this when. So if we put put up that marker. It'll be between some lanes out of the. Well, it has to be off the edge. Yeah. Somewhere, but at least something to designate where the where the cemetery, the cemetery is. Cemetery yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that would be respectful. But you know, maybe state of Indiana don't care. We don't want to spit two hundred dollars for a sign. You know. Well, it's know. It, it's. Okay. The law doesn't require it, but I understand why. Well, I, I, I we understand don't why. We need laws to be historical and preservation yes. in my book. Yeah. 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 Bill, that could be one of those brown informational signs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Make it black and white so I can read it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> when, when they moved it to uh, Crown Hill, did uh -huh. you say uh, it was white something? Cemetery? White cell. White cell. S E L L. White cell. Okay. Do they and, and they sort of set it up like it was before? Mm -hmm. Do they actually have a sign in Crown Hill? That yes, says there's a sign out at Crown Hill that says this is the White Cell Cemetery. Yes. Oh, okay. Right. Yep. So you can go up. And then Crown Hill has an area that's called the Pioneer Area, where they, um, for several cemeteries that have been moved, um, that are that have been moved out there, then they it's in, it's in that designated area for these historic cemeteries that are moved out there. And there's signs for all of those. Yeah. That's. Three of them Is that the uh, west end of uh, Crown Hill? It's in the, it's in the, the new in section. section. In the section north of 38th Street. Yes. And uh, it's quite prominent. You, you yeah. read the Especially the because the rest of the... There, it gives you that information, you know, where this came from. Yeah. yeah. It's all quite clear. But I'm out here it's, now. Look yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, north of 38th Street, that yeah. part of Crown Hill, and it's the west end. Yeah, and especially for the the cemetery or the stones that are out there look very because it's in the new section are very different than the stones that we put out. So you can it's very visible and you can very much see it. Did they actually take those stones. Yes, they actually took those stones and moved them out there. Yes, so yep. All right, so if you're going to work on a site, there's several steps to work for. First is organizing your group. Now, as as uh, Catholics in his church, every kid who gets confirmed has to do volunteer work. I mean, I had to do it. Um, so why not? organize your kids in your church to come out and work on the cemetery have it as a part of the uh, of the church you know the church group and stuff but I also um, very much encourage to open it up to the general public because there are cemetery advocates out there that if you put it in the paper they come out of the woodwork um, Delaware County did something like this um, in their center township trustee um, wanted some help with the working on the cemetery and so he put an ad in the paper said hey we're gonna work on the cemetery this day if anybody wants to come out he had 30 people showed up They've cleaned up all the cemeteries in his township and have actually expanded now to the entire county. And every weekend, there are 30 to 35 people who travel around the county cleaning up cemeteries. So definitely getting things organized. But you also want someone in charge because you don't want people nilly-willy going off on their own because you want to have a plan and make sure you're doing things right. Um, you want to research. You want to make sure you know what you're getting yourself into, how many people are supposed to be buried there, when was the cemetery started, because this is going to make a difference in some of the things that you do in the cemetery. So I'm a big fan of research and making sure you've got kind of all your um, documentation done. Definitely finding the other groups in your community that are doing work. If you wanted to know who those are, give me a call. I try to keep track of kind of who's doing what in the state, so that way if you're doing something in Lafayette or you're doing something in, in even in Marion County, I can tell you, well, hey, you need to get in touch with so-and-so because they're also doing cemetery preservation. Big fan of knowing your laws. We would hate for you to get arrested doing something you weren't supposed to be doing in the cemetery. I do have a list of laws in the state, so please feel free to grab those before you leave. Um, so you've got to know what's, you know what's legal, what you're allowed to do, not allowed to do. Landowner permission. You can't go into a cemetery and do work without landowner permission. I mean, you can't, I can't go onto your property and paint your house without your permission. You can't go into the cemetery. So making sure that you um, know whoever, whether it's the diocese that owns it or local church or if it's the township trustee's responsibility now, but making sure, um, again, get that word out and then have a plan. Um, big part is, one of the biggest part of the plan is education and knowing what you're doing so that you're not, again, doing some kind of work that I then put you in my PowerPoint um, presentation next time is please don't do this. Um, you get your research before started. 
before starting and you're going to have some costs and some supplies again depending on what you're going to do if you're just cleaning up the brush then maybe people will bring their own tools to cut down things but if you're going to be doing um, restoration work on some big obelisks you're going to need the equipment that is necessary to pick up the obelisk and move it and things like that um, we want to determine the location of graves um, whether and in, in, in which direction all right pioneers um, because we're judeo-christian bury east to west your head faces the west your feet face the east and then the tombstone is on the west end of the grave it's a headstone the lettering of that tombstone faces the west also now as catholics we like to be a little different we face a crucifix so you have to find the crucifix in the area and find out which direction that person would be facing to, so that their feet face the crucifix. Again, though, your wording is going to face away from the grave because it was um, considered uh, bad luck to cross over someone's grave. So when you would walk in a cemetery, if I have a line of stones here and I can read all the who's buried there and the bodies are over there, I can walk along, read who these people are, and not walk over their grave. Now this changed about the 1880s, 1890s, and we've changed, and today when you go to someone's grave, the tombstone is at the headstone, is at the head of the grave, but you actually have to stand on the grave in order to read who's buried there. But you need to know that, so when you're doing restoration on a pioneer cemetery, or a pioneer's grave, to which direction the tombstone should be facing. So location of, is, is, location of graves is important. And then you've got to clear plants. There are historic plants in cemeteries, and some you'll want to keep because they're historic, but others you want to kind of clear out. Now I've got some examples to show you. And then you've got to know what stones to fix, to replace, or just to leave alone. There are some stones that are in such bad shape that if you do any work to it, you're just going to damage it. And so understanding that, and that comes back to that knowledge. Um, some more things on that. Um, you know, again, working with different groups, um, if you've got veterans in there, maybe working with the, the VFW or some group like that, maybe they'd give you some funds to help um, do the restoration on those um, graves. Um, again, you have different religious graves and ethnicity, and so maybe if you've got a bunch of German graves, you talk to the German Historical Society and maybe they would do something with you guys on that. Um, you have different types of gravestones, so knowing whether you have a marble or a granite is going to make a difference in what type of material you use to clean it. So you have to know that. Um, and you got to look for your unmarked graves. And let me talk about the grave orientation again. I've got a great map, or here's a great example. So they put these stones back up, and here's the footstone, and then here's the body, and here's your headstone. But they put the headstone facing the wrong direction because the writing's here, so in order to read the person's information, I need to step on the grave. I actually want this stone turned around so I can walk along the back end of it and not step over anybody's grave. Now again, this is not something I think we deal with today or we worry about today, but our ancestors, that was an issue. So I've got a great drawing that a librarian did for me that shows the difference of how it is today. So you've got the body, this is gonna be the east, this is the west, here's your tombstone, your inscription's over here, you're standing there to, to read it. Today, here's the body facing east to west, here's the tombstone, but you've got to stand here in order to read it. So if anybody wants a copy of this, please let me know. But I had a librarian who heard my uh, talk, and so she made that for me, and it's very visual. All right, so what's something you need to bring? Natural brushes. You do not want to, to do any cleaning. You don't want a plastic brush, or you don't want a brush with color. If you go into a brush with color and clean the stone, you're going to have blue or orange specks on the stone. A bucket with water. Um, I'm a big fan of gloves. And then tools to remove the growth. And anything that you use on the stone, if you cannot use on your skin, don't bring. So metal's bad. Metal actually scratches the stone, so we encourage. Um, there's plastic, uh, like putty knives. Those work really good to remove algae, um, wood, things like that, to remove the algae. And basically what you do is it's one part ammonia, four parts water. You put it in a spray bottle. You spray the stone down, scrub, clean with, run, with fresh water, and you keep doing that until it's clean. It's a lot of elbow grease. Um, but before you get started, and never, ever, ever use um, metal brushes. Bleach, bleach is bad. It makes the stone very pretty white at the beginning, but if you ever put too much bleach in your laundry, it turns that yellow color, it'll do that to the stone. After sitting out in that sun for a while, it's, it'll start to turn the stone this very bizarre yellow color, and you can't get it out. 
so don't do that. Um, no acids. I've had people say, well, you can use muriatic acid. Well, that just eats the stone away, and eventually you're not going to be able to read those inscriptions. Um, the stone will never look like it did originally. It's not supposed to. It's going to have what we call a patina, a nice little stain um, look to it. It's going to have that. That's just, it's an old stone. That's just what it's supposed to have. And we don't want to use the cement or anything else that's going to damage the stone. So we basically say if you can't use it to your skin. So ammonia, you're going to stink, but ammonia you can put on your skin and it doesn't do anything. It's not going to damage you. Um, you know, water and some good uh, elbow grease will get you what you need. It, I mean, this is a good example of kind of what that'll do. I mean, it'll, depending on what, what, the, what the algae is of how much is going to get it off, but yes, it'll get most of it off. Um, so the first thing you need to do is make sure your stone is safe to clean. So the first thing I always do is you go up to the stone and just wiggle it like this. If it's going to fall over with you um, rubbing on it, don't clean it. You need to stabilize it first. Um, if it's sugaring, which is you go up to the stone and literally go like this, and if a bunch of stone comes off in your hand, that's called sugaring, it's just a bad stone. It was just a bad quality of stone. Between that and the acid rain, it is, de is decaying, and you're just going to cause more problems and to, than if you just left it alone. Uh, marble predominantly, but it also limestone sugar. I mean, you, when you go up to a limestone, you're going to get some off, but I mean, I'm talking like it, you get a handful off of it. Yeah, so limestone does it, um, marble does it, but um, the granite doesn't do that. But yeah, that's predominantly from those two. And you got to know your material. If you've got a polished um, granite stone and it just needs to be cleaned off, Windex works. But actually, Windex has ammonia in it. But Windex works just fine. You don't, you don't need to do as much with that. If you have um, a sandstone, which are s stones that you get down in southern Indiana, you don't use ammonia. It's just um, water. So you just need to know your materials. Again, those classes, if you take some classes, that'll definitely help you. Use a natural brush, water and ammonia, and you rinse, rinse, rinse. So it's, uh, again, it's time consuming. It is something that takes a while, but it's something that makes a big difference in what the cemetery looks like. And you might have some more advanced restoration and might need training. So if you have stones that are broken in three pieces and you need to epoxy them back together, you need to take a class because you can't just use anything to put those together. I have seen people use Gorilla Glue. That does not work well. Um, I've seen people use cement. It looks bad and then also doesn't hold it together and it breaks apart pretty quickly. Where there's certain epoxies that are made for stones and in a certain way and there's just a, there's a process. It's not hard. Everybody in here could do it, um, except for me. I'm not allowed to touch the stones anymore. The people at the class tease because every time I seem to touch the stones, I break them. So I stand around and just watch. Um, but it's not something that, any, and it's not something difficult. It's something that you could definitely do, definitely um, make a difference in your cemetery. All right, but what if you can't do restoration? If you're like me, you're not allowed to touch, or you have a group of seniors who are just d can't do it, or you've got a group of young kids, because there's certain things you don't want the young kids doing. So there's other things that you could do um, preservation-wise or in your cemetery to make a difference. And I think the biggest thing to do is maintenance. And I'm, not, I'm just talking about some very basic things, like this um, shrub line here, Every time I go out to the cemetery, it gets a little bit farther out. The mower doesn't go quite as far in, and pretty soon it's going to be taking over those back stones. So making sure that every time you mow, you mow back as far as you need to, and keeping that, you know, that brush taken care of. It's easy. Um, it's something you only probably have to do like once a year, but it's just something that you need to make sure you keep up with. Taking care of plants that have gone awry. Um, this is a yucca plant. Yucca plants were put on cemeteries. They're a, a historic um, pro, um, plant. It keeps the soul in the ground, is what our pioneer ancestors thought. And I don't know if you can see the stone that's right in here. He is being eaten by the yucca plants. So getting this cut back is going to make a big difference on the, the stone. Now, I'm a big fan of leaving historic plants in the cemetery but you need to balance the difference betw the, between the plant and the stone. And so you could you know, cut back a lot of this, and still, but still keep some of it so that it's still there on the cemetery or on the grave, but you can still see the stone and it's not damaging the stone or eating the stone. Um, this one is a gopher or groundhog that has gone awry. Um, 
groundhogs love cemeteries because it is disturbed ground. You know, there's been some digging, so it's easier for them to dig. But there's nobody in there bugging them. There's not a lot of people in and around. And so they um, are dangerous, to, especially um, pioneer cemeteries or historic cemeteries, because they don't have vaults. Um, vaults weren't required by law until the 1930s, and they're actually not required anymore today. But they were required in the 1930s, but you know, today they're not even required. Um, a lot of cemeteries, they have that as their rule, but it's not a state law. And so historically, you know, all you've got is a six foot hole, you've got a three foot coffin and then three feet of dirt. And that coffin has rotted over the years and has lost integrity. And so it's easier for that, that groundhog to get in there and get, you know, get in there and get things moved around. Um, unfortunately, I have had to pick up human remains off the surface from when a groundhog goes in because they dig out stuff. And if the body's in the way, they'll dig it out and get it in, out of the way. So get, taking care of those animals that are in the cemetery that are causing problems is huge. Um, this one is, this, is this cemetery is pretty bad and they need to get that taken care of. And then this is a, that mower, and so we were talking about the mowers coming through. You see the, the line that goes through here? That is from the mower deck. Every time it's going past, it just rubs up against it. Eventually, that stone's gonna snap there. And so then you have a repair to do. Instead of just making sure that the, the mower guy is just a few inches away from the stone, um, and so talking to whoever your mowing company is, I think is a huge thing, and making sure that they're not getting too close. Now it might require weed eating. I know that takes time. Um, we do, we, we discourage um, weed killer around the stone because if you, two things, one is the weed killer is a salt based, the salt that gets into the ground and comes up through this um, soil into the stone and then starts eating the stone away. And then also if you take up too much of the, the grass and stuff around the stone, all you're left with is dirt. That grass is what keeps the dirt in place, and you'll get erosion, and eventually it'll wash out, and then you'll have problems with the stone leaning. So that does take some hand labor. You're going to have to go through with a, a weed eater and stuff like that periodically and do that. But it, you know, doing that once a month and mowing the rest of the time, at least it'll prevent somebody from coming up like that, and eventually it is going to snap that stone. All right, and then some other projects that you can work on that you can definitely have, again, have the kids with um, confirmation, CYO, things like that, or even some of the adults in the, the um, cemetery. It's cleaning up the, the yard, just making sure every week that limbs that get blown down from the uh, wind and from you know, things like that, if you've got people who've tra you put trash in the cemetery, getting that always cleaned up. You can do a reading of the tombstones, getting a list of who is buried in the cemetery, where they're buried, kind of what's on the tombstone, and then giving that information to the library, make sure that the church, the parish office has it. Um, so that way when someone comes in to do their genealogy, they, you, know, you can say, well, you know, so-and-so is buried out here. Um, history of individuals, it's a great way, you know, who are the leaders of your church? They're buried in your cemetery. So doing a history of them so that you always know your history and know what's, who's been important in your um, community. Flags on the veteran stones, making sure that, you know, at Labor Day or at uh, Memorial Day, 4th of July, things like that, that there are flags on the stones and that they're picked up afterwards. Big, I, I, I hate it when I go out to cemeteries and the flags have been put out, that's great, but it's three months later and they're all looking horrible and then they're falling over on the ground, which I was always taught, you don't let this flag touch the ground. So these are laying all over the ground. So if you're going to put flags out, make sure that you take them up when it's time be so that they, that's respectful. Um, websites, we talked about how do I know that where the cemetery is and things like that. Almost everybody's using the web anymore, so getting stuff on the website I think is a, is a positive thing. And then some signs of the cemetery, some, whether it's interpretive signs, um, who owns the cemetery, where do I go for more information, things like that. I think are projects that you can do even if you can't do the restoration. So it's a good start of a project um, for the community even if it's not a full restoration. Because all of this stuff little by little is what you're going to need to do to kind of combat time and things like that. All right, so there is all you need to know, well, for the moment, all you need to know for the moment about cemetery projects and restoration. More questions? Yes, Bill. Those cemeteries that I would go looking for, which were on the USGS, mm -hmm. are, are those private Okay, so, so who's the owner is basically your question. How do you find out the owner of a cemetery? Um, the first thing I always do is um, you go to the uh, auditor's office 
And for that parcel, who's paying property taxes? So if there's somebody paying property, if it says Bill Selms paying property taxes, then you're the owner of that cemetery. Um, it may say, um, you know, St. Anne's Church, and they're exempt. So they're not paying property taxes, but St. Anne's Church is the owner of that cemetery. Um, let's say St. Anne's Church doesn't exist anymore. They, you know, they went defunct, there's no one around, then that becomes the township trustee's um, property. So those are the, you know, the, the, I always start with the auditor's office. Um, sometimes though, their cemeteries kind of fall through the cracks and we're not really sure and it's kind of, it's this bizarre thing, but most cemeteries you can find through that, through that auditor's office. To become public property, just like if it were the government, just like it's the post office or the fire department. And yes. But, but not all those cemeteries would fall under the jurisdiction of or the ownership of the township trustee. No. So what's the difference? Only ones that fall under the jurisdiction of the township trustee is no taxes being paid on the property, no organization that doesn't pay property taxes that's a viable organization to care for it and it's established before the February 1939 date, then they become the township trustee's responsibility. But if it's the city cemetery, theoretically the city's a viable organization and that's, so they're, they're the owner of that. Or I'm the farmer who owns 160 acres and there's a cemetery on my property and I'm paying property taxes, then that's mine. Or it's the church's property or whatever. So it's, um, it's gonna be one of those owners. So it's gonna be either government, whether it's state, city, county, township, it's going to be a non-for-profit, a cemetery association, a church, or it's going to be privately owned. And there are corporations, too, that would be privately owned, too. But you were talking earlier about moving cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Before a cemetery is moved, of course, you could have the jurisdiction of law to do a, a, a court. court. Yeah. To court. But is there a review process through DNR? No. Okay, so he wanted to, um, there was a process through called 106. Um, we're the state preservation office, and anytime state or federal funds or federal per, state or federal permits are um, required, then they have to go through our office for a review. It's called Section 106. Um, no, they do not have to go through us unless they're using state or federal funds. So when NDOT moves, decides to move a cemetery, that has to go through a 106 process. Um, but Walmart decides to move the cemetery, they do not have to, they don't even have to notify us that they moved it. Um, so, it, which is a problem for me because I can't update my cemetery registry if I don't know, but they don't have to notify us. Um, the coal companies, which is our biggest mover of cemeteries in Indiana is the coal companies, they don't have to work through us. They have their own laws and they um, work through the Division of Reclamation, who is in DNR, so they come down and they, they talk to me about it, but they don't have to notify us. So. And we don't, get to, we don't get any say in it. We do with NDOT, or when there's you know, Section 106. We can recommend um, archaeology, which we prefer to a funeral home director. But in the end, they could choose a funeral home director if they wanted to. Um, but we could just recommend that they go with archaeology. So yeah, it's not as much oversight on our part as we might like. But that's just the, the law is written that it's through the health department and the uh, court system. Yes, ma'am. Are these cemeteries that uh, the trustee is responsible mm -hmm. for, could a person actually go in and buy the cemetery back from the trustee or yeah, take over yeah. the maintenance of the cemetery? Let's say they had some relatives buried in it and, and they're, really, they're really interested in is the preservation of it, so they decide, well, I'd like to be responsible for the cemetery. They can do that. Can yeah, so she asked, can you buy the cemetery back from the trustee? You could buy the cemetery back from a trustee. You could go in and say, look, my family, these eight plots are my family. I want to care for those. And I don't know any trustee who wouldn't say, go ahead, because then that's less tax, you know, it's less money that they have to spend. Um, so yeah, they definitely could. Um, buying a cemetery is kind of tough because you've got, in, in um, setting up like new graves and things like that is possible, but it's, it's, there's a lot of hoops to jump through because we want to make sure that the cemetery, you know, you, you're the good person, you want to care for it, but then when you pass away, are your kids and grandkids going to want to take care of it? Yeah. So there's, there's all these things that you know, need to set up in order to uh, make sure that you're setting enough money aside to do future preservation, future. 
you have to have a little bit of money and set up some kind of a, uh, like a perpetual care fund or something like that to do that. No. Yes. So it's uh, definitely working with the trustee and, and possibly even doing it that way and saying, hey, I'll just you know, help you with the, the finances of it. Because um, then, then it's always being in trust and things like that. Mm -hmm. when it comes to moving cemeteries, yes. that sort of thing. Uh, who controls the nature of those rules and regulations that they abide by? Okay, so he went, uh, who controls the, um, the coal company's rules and regulations? Well, it comes through two ways. One is that the state law has passed that has very, that has talks about things. Um, to clarify and to, um, uh, you know, maybe if, if it's not clear in the law, um, that we'll do with what's called an administrative code and then that is um, like the state then, the state agency that's responsible for it. And in Indiana, it's a division of reclamation out of DNR. And so then they'll have r specific rules too that they'll, they'll say, all right. Uh, and this, this, when we do specific rules, we have to go through the Natural Resources Commission. It's open to the public. We can't just make the rules. Um, we have to like put it out to, for public hearings and things like that. But if the state says um, they can move the cemetery, and it's just as vague as that, but you want to kind of come up with what are the steps for that, then you would go through the Natural Resources Commission. They would kind of create these um, rules, and then it would be open to the public for, for comments, and then be passed. And every, I don't know if it's three or five years, but every so often, those um, administrative codes have to be re-heard through the Natural Resources Commission. Because I have one through um, cemetery registry that deals with um, probing in cemeteries and looking for covered tombstones, and we have a rule about that. Um, and we just had to go through another hearing where it's, it's, been a, it's been a rule for about seven years. And so we just did another hearing to let the general public come in and if they don't like it because it doesn't work or they want it to be stricter or whatever, people can comment on it. And then the, the Natural Resources Commission actually um, then adopts those rules. So, and those are available on our, the websites. private corporations, uh, developers, whoever, this is the model they should be following. Yes, it'll give very specifics of what they have to provide. So then that way there's a consistency. If I'm asking you for this information, then when he just needs to move a cemetery, we're asking for the same information. So it's not, it's not subjective and stuff like that. So it's a very consistent um, listing of what's required and that's what those rules are for. One more question, yeah. Uh, is there any restriction on where they can move the cemetery to? They have to move it into an active cemetery. So they can't move it, don't say that. They could move it to another, an, an area, like let's say we wanna move it from here over to there, but then that area would have to be created under um, the, the law to become a cemetery. And part of, to create a new cemetery, part of it has to do with the health department, the local health department, is, is that property good for um, burials? Because if it's close to the water table, if it's this, it's that, if it's in the floodplain, you're not gonna want burials there. So it's gotta be in an active cemetery, but that could be a brand new cemetery, just an act, but it would be then done that way. So yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole list of rules on it for um, moving. It's not cheap. And it's not easy, but it's not, it's not supposed to be because we shouldn't just be willy-nilly moving people. And so there's a whole process that you, if you decide to move a cemetery, you've got to think through all of this and make sure that's exactly what you're going to want to do. Yes, I guess my question was, uh, what about, I, I hear about this often on TV, but what about if it were like an Indian burial ground they found mm -hmm. as opposed to just a, what we would consider a regular right. cemetery? Does the same rules apply? So she asked if um, the same rules apply to Native American burial grounds as to cemeteries, sort of. Um, it also, you have the same rules about, of some of the cemetery, but then you also have federal law. It's called NAGPRA, it's called Native American Grave Protection Repatriation Act, NAGPRA. And what that has to do with is that it allows consultation by Native American tribes to what happens with those remains. And we get that all the time. When we get people, you know, you're, you're building, you're digging for a, f a foundation and there's human remains. So you find human remains, call the, our office. You have two days to call our office. We contact the coroner's office. And what we're gonna do there is the first thing we're gonna do is find out 
are these new burials? Is this, is this a crime scene? Or is this old burials? So uh, new burials is anything after 1949. So if we think that person's been dead for 100 years or 1,000 years or whatever, then it's no longer the coroner's issue. They don't care. And then it becomes under ours. And then we work with the landowner what's the best process. Um, if it's pioneer or it's you know, European American graves, that's a di then we start working with, okay, are you going to leave the grave there and make it a cemetery? Or are you going to move it? But if it's Native American graves, then it gets into this, again, this NAGPRA where we have to contact um, the historic tribes of the area and talk to them and s have them help with um, consultation. So. It is, it, that is, that is the, 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 the prickly issue is um, the Miami Indians of today, is there a genetic link to the tribe that, of that person that's there? Because it may have been the Miami or the Potawatomi or, but, or it may not have been. And so that, that's why NAGPRA gets sticky and why I am so happy I don't have to do with that. Our, uh, our director of our division, who's an archaeologist, he's getting to do with all the NAGPRA issues in the office, and I am happy to have him do that. Um, so, yeah, as soon as we realize that there are Native American graves, it goes off my table, it goes over to my director's table, and he gets the one that gets to deal with it. Because, again, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it gets very involved, and it has to do with, you know, what's the likelihood that this is this tribe, and um, so, yeah, so that, that becomes that an issue. Oh, it does, it comes up all the time. We average about one accidental discovery. That's what we call it. When you dig and you didn't mean to find something, it's an accidental discovery. We average about one a month. Sometimes more, sometimes less. You know, in the winter, you don't find as many because people aren't digging. But in the summer, when there's a lot of construction, you'll find we average about one a month. Sometimes it's that lost cemetery that we knew was out there somewhere, but we didn't know exactly where. And sometimes it's graves that we d had no clue it was there until they were dug up. So. So A corner in our office, yep. That's the, yes, and that's the thing. We want to make sure that it's not a, a case that they need to deal with. So that's the first thing we do is we uh, deal with the coroner's office and um, a professional called a phys uh, physical anthropologist, and they are specialists in bones. If you guys have ever seen the television show Bones, she's a physical anthropologist, and they can they are, have the ability to look at a skeleton and for tell you gender, um, race, probable age of death, sometimes with the cause of death, and how long those bones have been buried. So that's their, their skill. Um, we actually have one of the best uh, physical anthropology programs in the United States at the University of Indianapolis. Um, the guy who's in charge of it is Dr. Naraki, and he's amazing, and he is one of 60 um, licensed physical anthropologists in the country. He's amazing. So every time you see, like if you see the helicopter um, of the news going over a scene and they're like, you know, physical anthropologists or scientists go out to the human remains, that's Dr. Naraki and his students. And they'll go out and do an, an analysis of those remains to try to figure out, again, does the coroner care or is it then become under our jurisdiction? So. Yep. Uh, <laughs> In my, in my interest in German Catholic cemeteries, I've discovered that there's a, there's a particular type of marker, which is metal. Ah, does so, it look blue? Well, no. OK. No. It's either cast iron. The crucifix. Yeah. Is it a crucifix? These are heads, these are head stones. OK. So they're either a wrought iron, uh -huh. they're cast iron, <clears throat> and then the later manifestation <coughs> of this tradition I've seen it in Du Bois County, threaded pipe. Yes, I've seen the threaded pipes. Okay. The threaded pipe is a descendant of the wrought iron, and then the cast iron is 19th century. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I've gone to all the Catholic cemeteries in, in my beloved Franklin County, and there's quite a few of those, and I think there might be some at St. Joseph, some uh, wrought iron, I'm not sure. but. There was one which was being destroyed by the lawnmower. So I dug it up. I didn't ask anybody what the way I look at it is. I'm gonna do something good. Why why get a no? So I dug it up. So it was a cross, wrought iron, mm -hmm. four feet high, and the uh, cross piece was about oh, 18 inches to two feet. So I dug it up, I took it home, I cleaned it up found some junk metal and my dad welded it on. I restored it and then I went back 
and because it was just sitting in the ground. So it had been buried yeah. so that the cross piece was about a foot off the yep. ground and the lawnmower kept hitting it so that the arms of the cross were going back and yeah. back. Yeah. So I, I, I mixed up some concrete and I said it. That was 30, that was 32 years ago. And, and I painted everything too. So it needs some more paint, but the concrete base is holding up and it, it was much better, much better condition now than yep. when I saw it over 30 years ago. You did everything right except for ask for landowner permission. Uh, but no, I mean, I, and that's what it takes. It takes individuals caring and making that difference. Um, so the metal, the, and it is the German Catholics who love these metal, I, I've seen a lot of them as crucifixes or crosses. I, I've seen a couple actually headstones that are made out of metal. There's another metal that you'll see that as you look across the cemetery, it looks blue. Yeah. It's called white bronze or zinc. Um, this was popular in the late 1800s. Um, they were made out of Connecticut and then there was a dis distributor out of Detroit. So we get a lot here in Indiana. And they were, cons they were sold as the advertisement as a cheap way to honor your dead. Well, who wants to be seen as cheap when they're honoring their dead? So they, were, they didn't last very long selling wise but they last a long time now i mean if you go up to them now but they're hollow so if you see one of these you just like i said it's, it's this blue tint you once you see one you'll you'll know know it you go up and you can knock on it and it's hollow because of just the way it's made out of and then there was these plates that you could replace the plates um and uh, for different information but uh so those are the kind of the two you get but the there's the it's the good german good german hardy stock that want their cast iron they usually have a Right, which is stamp sheet metal, right? Yeah, um, which is often gone. Yes. Um, I think in this area, since we don't have uh, large check cemeteries, uh, the, the Germans have a monopoly on that, that style. You go out to Iowa and the states beyond the Missouri, the Catholic cemetery, especially if, if it's a, a check settlement, they have the same, the same design. Probably the, the, I think the biggest uh, uh, collection of those metal uh, markers is in the town whose name I cannot remember now in uh, Iowa. The importance was that uh, late 19th uh, century, early 20th century, the composer Smetana had come from Bohemia and he lived there for uh, some time. Well, that cemetery must have it'd be 30 or 40 of those of those markers. I've never seen anywhere else. You should get a couple from about 1870s and 80s. That's usually what the date is that you, that you found. Yeah. And the, the, since it was a, it still is a, a Czech settlement, Czech Catholic settlement, that uh, they continue to use the same kind of marker mm -hmm. for several and that's where, you, again, that some of that research will help. And because, again, you, while you have Catholic, we're all similar there, we have different backgrounds and different ethnicity, ethnicities. And so, um, you know, the Czech German is going to, uh, stones are going to be different than the Irish Catholic and, or the French Catholic. And so you've got some, some knowing that research is going to help with what you do. Uh, if you get some of the Eastern European um, individuals coming over about the 18, 1880s, 1890s, they're going to put um, these ceramic photos on their stone, regardless of religion. So you see it in the Jewish cemetery as well as the Catholic cemetery, because it has to do with their ethnicity, not their religion. And having the ceramic photos are very popular. Again, made in Chicago, so they're really popular in Indiana. And so knowing this stuff is gonna help you as you do restoration, can explain kind of what's going on. And you know, you've got this great Czech Catholic cemetery that maybe even if historically you don't even know is there, or if you don't know that it was a Czech community, mm -hmm it will explain why you have so many crosses of this metal cross. So this is why I'm a big fan of that research. Those, ca those cast iron markers in Oldenburg were locally manufactured. Fantastic, yeah. His name's on it, the model number, and then oddly it says Oldenburg, Indiana, and then it says United States in French. I don't know why. Ah. So as you talk about, okay, the, the, mark, the name of the guy who made the markers on that. Uh, lots and lots of stones, you will find the name of the marker, the, the, the carver, at the bottom of the stone. So these artisans, this was advertising. So I went out to the uh, cemetery and I saw this beautiful you know, metal stone or, or this great carving and I was like, I wonder who did that? You'd have that person's name on there so you would know who to, to get in touch with in order to show you 
the, um, you know, that, to give you more stones. Okay, I've got about five minutes left. We can continue to ask questions. I want to see if I can find that picture of that, uh, of that cemetery where I told, showed you the beginning. I think it's in my, one of my talks here. Nope, that's not it. You guys don't care about the Underground Railroad. So um, if you've got questions, any more questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. But I'll see if I have this before and after. I thought I had it in here, but... No, looks like I don't have it in here. Oh, bummer. It's really, it's really quite impressive. Again, the before and after difference is amazing. But any more questions? Why did you choose that for your? Uh, the screensaver. I just, um, I think it's funny that they spell their cemetery two different ways. Oh, okay. <laughs> to and, um, you know, I've, I switch it out a lot. Um, I've got one that's. The Paris Cemetery, and then it just says dead end. The road's a dead end, but so I have that periodically comes up. Um, I find so I find humor in cemeteries. That to me, they're not macabre places. Of they're they're beautiful places that you know you can have a picnic in and then laugh about too. So I just was amused that they can't figure out how to spell their own name. So so I change it out a lot. Yes. Because a lot of the people don't want to take care of them, they're elderly, and they'll have overgrowth and various other things. And then we can sometimes set, set stones and reset other items mm -hmm. for them. So it's a nice little fundraiser for the boys, but it also gets them out to be able to do some things uh, that you wouldn't normally do in a cemetery, rather than knock stones down there. Exactly, doing bringing the right thing. So I'm trying to, as a role model, teach them right there. But I had one scout that came to me, and he wanted to do his eagle project. And we went to Crown Hill, and he did 1,400 Revolutionary and Civil War stones. We pulled them all and put the stone below because they sunk down yep. to the ground about four feet deep. And we got the uh, chemicals out of California. Uh, of course, this is the third largest cemetery in the nation sitting here in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And the government kind of oversees a lot of it, but they kind of neglected for years that particular section of about an acre and a half. And so they were overwhelmed to have somebody interested in doing it. And we went out and did that. And I was out there the other day, and out of those 1,400 stones, I think there's like two have resunk down. They're about, about that far out of the ground right now, but all the rest, we got them all in line. It really looks sharp. But if somebody would like to do a project like that, Crown Hill is very good to work with. Crown Hill's great to work with. They, the they, they care about the cemetery. Yep. But uh, I found everything but them positive. I've never had a problem with any of my scouts and we go to do projects. Yes. They, they are very nice. They are fantastic. And scouts, I think, are fantastic. We do, you know, I get a lot of scouts who call me and want information. So either scout group or your, for their Eagle project or anything like that. I actually had one girl scout for her, I think they call it the Daisy, is what their, their version of the Eagle is. I think it's the Daisy. And so having scouts, either Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, is an amazing way to get again you get them in the cemetery you get them doing positive stuff in there so that again when they're 17 they don't decide tipping over stones is fun and i think that's a very positive way to do it yeah most and i can't say it's just boys maybe but boys do like to do damage and characteristical break windows uh, yep. i mean i'm a boy i've been that all my whole life i'm going to continue to be a boy <laughs> It's the nature of boys, and that's that's part of the habit. Yep, if you've got right. role models and people that try to teach them, right, even though they've done wrong, try to get them on the right track, right. get them back. Maybe later on as a future adult, they'll be a, a little better. But the problem is a lot of people just don't care, and they just buzz on and yep. care less about the youth. But, yeah, and give them some positive focus for that energy. Yeah, so, you know, any, anybody that ever wants to do anything for Crown Hill, they're, they're wide open. They, yes. They're nice people. They are, they are fantastic to work with. Would you find the uh, uh, slides you have uh, showing the burials, I think there's an explanation right under those uh, drawings of why the East and West was uh, so well, important. It's, it's just a Judeo, Judeo, I don't know if she said that, but it's because we're um, Judeo-Christian and then when Jesus comes again, yeah. that we can just rise, oops, rise to meet that, him. That it's, it's easier getting up I guess it's e he comes up from the east is the story I've heard. Yes. That yeah, that's what it is because he's supposed to come from the east, and so you would be able to sit up to, re to, to, to greet him.
is, is, the, is the why we bury that way. Um, again, Catholics will do, we will also bury towards the crucifix, so it's either east to west or towards the crucifix, but the same concept as the crucifix representing Jesus that you can sit up to greet him. So. But again, a north-south burial might indicate someone who's out of favor with the church, and I've seen that. Somebody's excommunicated, but still wants to be buried, like with their family, and the, the church will be buried that way. So, All right, well, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I'll be around. I've got some handouts here. Feel free to um, that. You can call me if you've got you know, questions next week or something like that. Please feel free to give me a holler. And um, again, if anybody wants that... Uh, those class, one of those free spots of the class, please let me know and I will be happy to get you, get your contact information about that.